My name is Stephen Peeler, Executive Director of the Infectious Disease Society of America Foundation. And today I'm happy to welcome you to the CDIF talk, the inaugural webinar of the new Dr. John G. Bartlett Education Series. This new series is a collection of infectious diseases lectures from industry experts and pre-recorded videos from Dr. Bartlett himself. These lectures honor the groundbreaking work and thought leadership of Dr. Bartlett, a pioneer in infectious diseases whose mentorship inspired many. On behalf of all of us at the foundation, I'd like to give a sincere thanks to Sears Therapeutics for supporting the CDF talk. We're grateful for their support of this exciting event. The month of November is recognized as C. diff Awareness Month, an effort to bring attention to a disease that affects nearly 500,000 Americans each year. Through this inaugural event and with the support of Cirrus, we will bring new insights to the table through the perspectives of experts in the field, as well as those who have experienced the disease firsthand. First, we will hear from Dr. Elliot Godofsky, one of John Bartlett's mentees, as well uh, as an esteem, esteemed infectious disease physician and member of the IDSA Foundation Board of Directors. Elliot? Hello, my name is Dr. Elliot Godofsky, and I serve on the Infectious Diseases Society of America Foundation Board. I have been in the private practice of ID for over 25 years in Sarasota, Florida, following my fellowship at the Johns Hopkins under the mentorship of Dr. John Bartlett, a relationship that lasted nearly 30 years until his recent passing in January of 2021. As a second year fellow, I had the unique opportunity of having Dr. Bartlett as my sole attending for an entire year on a newly created ID service in the Oncology Center. Over endless cups of coffee at four in the morning, as John was the ultimate early riser, I learned the art of infectious diseases in ways that have stayed with me all these years. And as an accomplished painter, John understood the importance of broad strokes, and this concept pervades his entire career. This year, we also lost Dr. Bartlett's wife, Jean, a wonderful person, tireless companion to John, and friend to so many of us privileged to know her. Dr. Bartlett's legacy is as expansive as it is unique, whether it's HIV AIDS, hepatitis C, or bioterrorism, John had an amazing ability to recognize important big ticket items before most others. He had a terrific crystal ball. His early research at Tufts University, New England Medical Center led to the discovery of C. difficile and the modern theory of antibiotic-associated diarrhea. Later work better defined community-acquired pneumonia, intra-abdominal infections, and the importance of B. fragilis in anaerobic pulmonary infections. John had the special gift of being able to synthesize basic science research with disease states into useful clinical models and applications. Throughout the long list of publications and awards associated with these important discoveries, John continued to place high value on patient care, mentoring, dedication to the furtherment of our field, and above all, loyalty and friendship. During his 25-year tenure as Division Chief of Infectious Diseases at Johns Hopkins, John helped establish one of the first dedicated HIV AIDS outpatient clinics, conducted critical treatment trials, edited numerous books, wrote scores of textbook chapters, lectured around the world, and chaired the first national committee that drafted treatment guidelines for HIV-infected persons. His crystal ball recognized early on the importance of bioterrorism preparedness, global health, antimicrobial stewardship, and antibiotic availability, just to name a few. His What's Hot in ID Symposium at the annual IDSA meeting was the best attended and best rated session for nearly a decade. I often think of Dr. Bartlett as the William Shakespeare of infectious diseases. It is hard to imagine that a single individual could accomplish in one lifetime the breadth 
and volume of his career. The wisdom of his words has been sorely missed during the current pandemic. Lastly, John's legacy lives on through his infectious disease extended family tree. So many medical students, residents, and fellows had their training and careers enriched and positively impacted by his work, dedication to clinical care, and teaching. Many of his mentees have gone on to be accomplished researchers, division heads, and prominent public health officials. All of his mentees are better persons for having known him. The John G. Bartlett Education Series will present a series of monthly webinars covering important topics in the field of infectious diseases, honoring the contributions, inspiration, and leadership of Dr. Bartlett. I would personally like to thank the IDSA Foundation Board and Ceres Therapeutics for their support of this terrific program. Well, it's great to hear from someone who worked so closely with Dr. Bartlett. Through the stories like these, we could truly witness his impact. As Dr. Godofsky mentioned, Dr. Bartlett helped co-discover C. diff. Now we will hear from someone who has experienced the disease firsthand. I'd like to introduce Kathy Bischoff, a C. diff survivor, a volunteer, and health advocate at the C. diff Foundation. Kathy? You are all aware of the impact that C. diff now has in communities worldwide. It is no longer an infection of the elderly in nursing homes or the result of a hospital stay. It attacks infants, children, and young adults of all races and genders. C. diff has no boundaries. Your commitment, your dedication, and your focus and research in the prevention and treatment of this horrific infection is so needed and deeply appreciated. What you do by educating and advocating for the prevention treatments, clinical trials, and environmental safety of a C. diff infection and reoccurrence truly matters. I'm Kathy Bischoff, and I survived seven C. diff infection reoccurrences throughout the course of two and a half years. My journey started as a result of an ongoing struggle with diverticulitis. On one December morning, I suffered another attack, and this time I couldn't get out of bed. I was transported by ambulance to the hospital. It was my fourth attack in three months. And similar to previous occurrences, I was treated with antibiotics. Several times during this three month period, I was prescribed double the normal antibiotic amount when my symptoms persisted. If I had only known then what I know now. While antibiotics are effective in treating bacterial infections, too much of a good thing can result in a C. diff infection. Upon my discharge from the hospital, I was told I had C. diff. My treating physician just casually mentioned it before I left saying, oh, by the way, you have C. diff. That was the first time I had ever heard of it. When I asked him for additional information, he said it was an infection in my colon and he gave me a prescription for it. I didn't know how serious the infection was, what to expect, or what precautions to take. I certainly didn't think anything about preventing another infection or managing my symptoms. I would take the prescription and this C. diff thing would go away. I had no idea that C. diff germs outside the body created spores, that spores can cause the infection, that spores can survive on surfaces for months or even years, and that they are now present in all of our communities. I was left in the dark. These are things that you are all aware of. I am now painfully aware. Today, I find the lack of information that was shared with me completely unacceptable. And that was the beginning of my C. diff journey. About a month later, I ended up back in the hospital for eight days after another diverticulitis attack. Options were discussed with my primary physician. We decided on a surgical procedure to have the sigmoid portion of my colon removed. It was the area of my colon causing these attacks. The surgery went well, but I felt miserable. During my post-surgical visit, my surgeon confirmed I wasn't recovering as expected. I was readmitted to the hospital and diagnosed with C. diff, my second infection. 
Six reoccurrences followed, and each was more vicious and more debilitating than the one before. Three of them required hospitalization. And during each infection, my life was turned literally upside down. I was forced to become housebound, and I became somewhat of an introvert. It was a very frustrating and a very isolating experience. I did not want friends or family to visit. I feared an uncontrollable bout of diarrhea, and I was always just feeling so sick. I was fighting constant dehydration, had severe cramping, and I was tired and nauseous all the time. Instances of diarrhea could occur 10 to 12 times a day. When going to my doctor's appointments, my car seat was protected with plastic. I carried a complete change of clothing, soap and water, and a container if my nausea couldn't be controlled. My husband became my support system during this time, helping me accomplish even the simplest of daily tasks. He became my lifeline. He prepared my meals, and he had to encourage me to eat. He got up nights to give me prescribed medication at directed intervals. He took over all the household duties I could not perform, and he tried to keep my spirits up. It was truly not an easy task being my caregiver. I was just so sick and many times not pleasant. Each time I started a new treatment, I was hopeful that it would finally conquer this infection. And unfortunately, without fail, C. diff would return about two weeks after the treatment plan ended. My system had become so weakened, I wasn't able to conquer the infection. I could not restore the needed beneficial bacteria to my microbiome after treatments. I had no way to fight C. diff from reoccurring. After my last treatment, which was a taper that lasted nine months, I started experiencing symptoms but that by this point were all too familiar. I tried desperately to convince myself that it was not a C. diff reoccurrence. The symptoms worsened, and I got tested. It can't be C. diff again, I kept saying. It just can't be. You can imagine my disappointment when I found out that I tested positive for yet another C. diff infection. I was devastated. I was physically, psychologically, and emotionally exhausted and questioning, could I even go through this again? Was this reduced quality of my life going to be my future? Even more convincing and concerning was would I have a future? I knew I no longer could continue down the same path. The specialists treating me were at a loss of what to do. They put me back on vancomycin and said they would do some additional research. But I may have to remain on vancomycin for the rest of my life. I told them that was not an acceptable option. They assured me they would research further and they would be back in touch. I never heard from them again. There had to be another alternative. So I desperately looked for other venues. Sick and frightened about my future, I made the decision that I had to advocate for myself and my own survival. While searching for information online, I found the CDA Foundation's website and I called into one of their support sessions. For the first time, I felt gratified and relieved. I was finally receiving so many of the answers I was looking for. I was treated with compassion and understanding by the CEDA Foundation staff. They were remarkable. I found people that finally understood. I learned about recommended nutrition, environmental safety, and so much more. I found out there were clinical trials for people dealing with C. diff infections. I was not aware, nor had ever been mentioned to me, that these trials even existed. The foundation told me that there were clinical trials available and being conducted when we spoke. There was hope. There was something to research. I discovered a clinical trial site doing an open label investigational treatment in St. Louis, which was five hours from my home. I shared this information with my husband, who simply said, email them now. I did, and I received a call from the research clinician within 15 minutes of pushing the send button. We had an in-depth conversation about the C. diff trial and about my ongoing battle. All my questions were answered, and further information 
was emailed and mailed to me. After doing additional research on my own and talking to my primary physician, who encouraged me, I applied as a candidate and I was accepted. And I felt a great sense of relief. Taking this action helped me feel in control. I had a new path. Knowing this, I felt empowered. My trial clinician was compassionate, knowledgeable, and also very helpful. I was impressed and comfortable with her and my team. On May 25th of 2016, I was administered the trial capsules. And I called them my magic gut bugs. The trial lasted for six months with both office visits and phone calls, and the capsules worked. We won the battle, and I had gained a friend. It's a joy to have my life back. The infection is gone, but not without leaving scars behind. Anxiety and fear of another C. diff infection remain. In 2017, I was diagnosed with severe arteri arterial fibrillation. After several cardiac conversions that proved unsuccessful, I underwent a cardiac ablation in late August of that year. I was assured by my doctors after in-depth conversations that the procedure would not involve my having to take antibiotics. Based on my past experience, I'm always in fear of needing them or in needing their use. Unfortunately, there were complications and two procedure-associated infections followed while I was in the hospital. They both needed to be treated with antibiotics. It was unnerving and it was remarkably frightening. My greatest fear was now a reality. Would they cause another C. diff infection? And what could I do? The answer, I advocated for myself. I became part of my treatment and very selective in the antibiotic choices. The infections were treated successfully, and I remained C. diff free. Numerous AFib incidents continued, however, and they required cardiac conversions and another ablation, which brought me no relief. Again, advocating on my own behalf, in February of last year, I underwent a third ablation at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio with favorable results. The first concern I discussed with my cardiologist about his treatment was antibiotic use and he understood completely. With proactive involvement in my medical care, I have not gotten another C. diff infection, but my journey isn't over. In fact, my journey has me here with you this afternoon. I am now a volunteer for the C. diff Foundation, and I am dedicated to raising awareness of this debilitating and isolating infection. From my experience, I've seen the importance of advocating and building educational networking around C. diff infections and the considerable burdens associated with them. The importance of helping patients and at-risk individuals and their families to empower themselves to make informed decisions about the prevention and treatment of this infection and their own medical health is so very important. Unfortunately, there are many others who suffer with C. diff and carry its scars. I have been anxiously awaiting FDA approval of medications to treat and prevent a reoccurrence of this debilitating and sometimes fatal infection. I am here today to celebrate Dr. John Bartlett, his achievements and your achievements. Today, we are closer to the day that I can put my anxiety and my fear behind me. The future of eliminating C. diff reoccurrences lie within reach. I am able to tell you my story because if it were not for the C. diff foundation and learning about clinical trials, instead of taking those magic gut bugs that conquered my battle with C. diff, my story would have ended waiting for a phone call I never received. I am so grateful for the C. diff foundation and for all of the progress being made with tireless efforts by many of you. It is not easy reliving my experience. Sharing my journey with others can be extremely painful, but no one should ever have to go through what I did to find the answer to defeating a C. diff infection. So I share my story and I share my story with you today because I have faith and I believe in you.
you will make the difference. You will find the way to end C. diff and its reoccurring agony. You all know, and it's my commitment, and I hope it is all of yours, that there is a growing need to educate and heighten awareness of the ramifications of a C. diff infection. And you all know, as I do, that C. diff is not just diarrhea. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for your uh, touching story, Kathy, and, and thank you for sharing that with us. Your perspective is invaluable in spreading the awareness of C. diff and showing the importance of education and obviously advocacy, in your case, advocacy for yourself. Now, I'd like to introduce Barbara McGovern, Vice President of Medical Affairs at Sarah's Therapeutics. This event today would not be possible without their generous support. Uh, we're proud to work with Sarah's to host C. diff talk. It has been an honor to launch the Dr. John G. Bartlett Education Series, series with Sarah's as a supporter. Thank you, Barbara, very much. My name is Barbara McGovern. Senior Advisor of Medical Affairs and Clinical Development at Ceres Therapeutics. We are delighted to be the proud sponsor of this new educational initiative in memory of the infectious disease giant, Dr. John Bartlett. I had the great honor to work with John for eight years as we established a comprehensive compendium of clinical management topics on a variety of infectious diseases for an online medical textbook. His depth of knowledge knew no bounds. As one of the co-discoverers of C. difficile and one of the earliest to understand the importance of an abnormal gut flora in the pathogenesis of this disease, he was fascinated by the newly emerging data in microbiome sciences and in C. difficile. It is only fitting that we dedicate this educational series to his memory, since John loved to teach and mentor others, and I was one of the lucky recipients of that deep fountain of knowledge. So without further ado, let's move to our first talk by one of the most prolific researchers in the field of C. difficile, Dr. Mark Wilcox. joining you from uh, Leeds in the north of England. Uh, and I, I want to give you a 20-minute talk about optimizing the treatment of C. diff and how to do that, to truly optimize treatment, means that we really do have to understand why it occurs. I want to start, though, by saying what an honor it is to give this talk in memory of John Bartlett. I, um, worked with him on only a handful of occasions and several thousand miles between us. Um, but the term that came to mind when I first met him, and indeed every time since when, I, when I've thought about him, is a gentleman and a scholar. That term, a gentleman and scholar, originated in the 1600s. And if you actually look at, at what it means and, and the connotation of a gentleman and a scholar. It, it's often referred to as a complementary term for a person, especially one who has done you a favor. And I'm gonna come back to the favor that John did me shortly. If you do a PubMed search of, of John Bartlett's name and, and C. diff, then, and as already been mentioned today, you find that, that John was at the C. diff story right from the start in 1978, multiple publications. That was the year that C. diff was identified as the cause of antibiotic associated colitis and indeed pseudomembranous colitis. But I, I wanted to skip through six years to 1984 and John was the sole author of a review in Reviews in Infectious Disease. Now, a lot of you will remember that. It's a, it's a discontinued journal, but before it was discontinued, it was a very much respected and indeed sister journal to Clinical Infectious Diseases, IDSA's own journal. And John 
wrote in that review that he, he reviewed the therapy of, um, of 189 patients that were given oral vancomycin, that's patients with C. diff induced diarrhea or colitis. And he noted that the response rate was 97%, perhaps a bit higher than, than we'd recognize. But tellingly, 46 patients, which is 24%, relapsed when treatment was discontinued. So way back in 1984, and indeed before 1984, it was well recognized that the best treatment options available left patients short one in four times, which is just not acceptable. And we've just heard a telling story from, from Kathy about that. So, so what was the, the favor that John did me? Well, you know, he, he, he laid the groundwork for eventually the, the subject that has dominated my professional career. I, I started my first publication was in 1990, but if it, if John hadn't been there, I probably would never have got interested in C. diff. So thank you, John, for being a gentleman and a scholar. So for most of my professional career, we have had two or three approved, so-called approved treatment options for C. diff infection. And whether it's two or three, metronidazole being the odd one out, because it's never actually been truly approved by regulatory authorities. But all three were antibiotics. Indeed, metronidazole is no longer recommended as an option because we know it's an inferior treatment to the other antibiotics available. But if we ask ourselves, what is the number one cause of CDI? We all know that it's antibiotic exposure. So I'll put a simple question. Why 40 years on, do we still rely on antibiotics to treat C. diff infection? And indeed to try and prevent recurrent infection. So in moving, moving on, taking the, the story on, let, let's first of all recognize the enormous burden caused by C. diff infection. Just one statistic is enough here. An approximate 1 billion excess dollars in medical costs each year consumed by C. diff infection in the US. That's CDC data. And as I said, we, we know risk factors for C. diff, old age, chronic illness, recent hospitalization, but recent antibiotic use stands far and above all the other risk factors as the key risk factor with a seven to tenfold increased risk of C. diff associated with recent antibiotic exposure. But if you just consider a patient's microbiome. And again, Kathy knows so much about this, uh, this subject for, for the, all the unfortunate reasons she told us about. And she referred to the microbiome. But think about the microbiome, the pathway that a patient's microbiome follows along the C. diff infection story. Most people's microbiome doesn't include C. diff small percentage perhaps, but most don't do not. And to go from a C. diff uncolonized to a colonized state requires usually antibiotic exposure. But then during that continued antibiotic exposure, it might be one antibiotic alone, it might be one of two, three, four, five antibiotics. The microbiome becomes more and more damaged and depleted, more dysbiotic. And then what do we do? When we diagnose C. diff infection, we give them another antibiotic. And if they're unlucky enough, the patient, the microbiome, to get a recurrence, we give another antibiotic. And so that derangement 
of the microbiome gets worse and worse and worse. And just remember that with every antibiotic that a patient sees, their risk of C. diff infection increases exponentially, not linearly, exponentially. Now those data that show that, which interestingly were published in CID in the mid 1980s, did not include the effect of the C. diff treatment antibiotic, but there's no reason why, unfortunately, the C. diff treatment antibiotic might not also, and is probably also, increasing the risk of C. diff infection, part of that exponential increased risk, in this case of a recurrence of C. diff infection. So you could think of a patient burdened by chronic diseases, by older age, by antibiotic exposure, and every additional antibiotic exposure risks being the straw that breaks the camel's back. So it's not surprising that with that exponential increase in risk of C. diff infection, we see an increasing, a markedly increasing risk of recurrent C. diff infection as we move from someone who has primary C. diff infection to someone with a first recurrence to a second recurrence. Their risk of recurrent CDI escalates. And the other thing that escalates is the risk of death. So recurrent C. diff infection is associated with about a 30% increase in risk of death compared with primary CDI. But remember, throughout that increasing C. diff risk escalator and that mortality escalator, the microbiome is becoming more and more deranged. So, so what can we do about a deranged microbiome? What we don't want to do is to give another antibiotic. Okay, I accept that an antibiotic may be needed, may be needed to address the initial acute infection and bring about resolution of acute symptoms. But if that's all we do, just give an antibiotic, we will not address the deranged microbiome. So the popularity of fecal microbiota transplantation is because people woke up to the need to address that derangement. But there are two buts that are important when we consider FMT. One is that it's often touted as being an extremely effective therapy in terms of preventing recurrence. But actually, if you look in, in terms of a systematic review and meta-analysis of studies of the use of FMT, then yes, you can see figures in the 80s and even in the 90s percent effect, efficacy at preventing recurrence, but those tend to be from uncontrolled studies and sometimes open label, but typically uncontrolled, sometimes just observational. If, however, you look at the efficacy of FMT in controlled, randomized trials, then the efficacy is in the mid 60s percent. So microbiome restoration, that's still worth having via the, the, the efficacy associated with FMT, but the second and important but associated with FMT is the safety consideration. And they've led to multiple warnings from regulators, um, FDA in particular. And so that, that in itself, and of course the fascination with microbiome restoration has led several groups and companies to try and design an ideal microbiome. Designer microbiome therapies is a, is a term that's sometimes used. 
but in order just just to stop and think about that designer approach imagine fmt is the entire represents the entire microbiome simple question is that the minimally effective dose? We heard Kathy talking about being given double the dose of antibiotic therapy. That's not optimal medicine. We like to give, we should give the minimally effective dose of an antibiotic, of a beta blocker, whatever. So is there a, an optimal minimally effective dose in the context of microbiome restoration and design and microbiome therapies are attempting, I suggest, to find that minimally effective dose. So, so what is microbiome restoration trying to do? Well, it's trying to restore the microbiome, obviously, but in doing that, it's trying to give back to the microbiome the colonization resistance that is responsible for the fact that only a very, very small proportion of people carry C. diff. So an intact, non-deranged microbiome is anti-C. diff. And it does that by direct effects and probably possibly also by immunoregulatory function as well. We don't understand that well, but that's what we believe. And, and another key part of of an intact microbiome is having a microbiome that is replete in secondary bile acids as opposed to primary bile acids. And secondary bile acids are directly inhibitory to C. diff proliferation. The converse is true for primary bile acids. So microbiome constituents that promote the good guys that produce or encourage the produ production of secondary bile acids, those, are, those should be part of the minimally effective dose in a microbiome restoration therapy. The other part about microbiome restoration is it's trying to restore epithelial barrier integrity, the epithelial barrier that's damaged, that mucosal epithelial layer, when it becomes inflamed, and that's part of the pathogenesis, that's that damage caused by the C. diff toxins, part of the key pathogenesis of C. diff infection. So there are data to show that restoring that barrier is a potential effect of microbiome restoration therapy. And in restoring that, that in the barrier integrity, that's part of that, of course, is reducing gastrointestinal inflammation. And there are various mediators of gastrointestinal mucosal inflammation that microbiome restoration therapy can downregulate, whether it does that via um, uh, immune uh, uh, via toll-like receptors or other pro uh, suppressing other pro-inflammatory mediators, cytokines, for example. That's the third component of microbiome restoration therapy. So to move on, the reason why we get recurrent seed of infection is because of a damaged, deranged mi microbiome. But it's also because C. diff doesn't go away in a significant proportion of patients who are treated with antibiotics for C. diff infection. And the reason for that, in a nutshell, is the spore form of C. diff. And the spores are resistant to antibiotics, whereas the, the vegetative forms are the susceptible form to the vancomycin, fidaxomycin, or in old terms, metronidazole that are used to treat C. diff. But the spores persist, as I say, in, a, in a at least a quarter of individuals, possibly more in small numbers, which we struggle to detect if we look for them. And those spores are there waiting for their heads to pop out 
to germinate when conditions are right. And when conditions are right, typically, is as the C. diff treatment antibiotic, the levels of that antibiotic fall below the MIC of C. diff. And in the presence of a deranged microbiome, C. diff recurrence occurs, proliferation of C. diff, more toxin production, more inflammation, more epithelial barrier damage. If we go and look, go, go back and look at FMT-based data and look at which components of the microbiome are typically in a donor stool that are poorly represented in the deranged recipient stool, then the component that stands out is the firmicutes, which include the clostridia, dominated indeed by the clostridia. And those firmicutes increase in the, um, in the microbiome of the donor recipients. And if you look weeks and days, weeks, and indeed months later, the firmicute component of the recipient matches and looks very similar to the donor component, firmicute component, and is completely different from the very small component of firmicutes in the C. diff patient, the baseline C. diff patient. So that has led us to believe that the firmicutes is a key component of a microbiome restate rest restoration therapy. Think of the, of, the, of the firmicutes potentially as a blueprint for microbiome restoration, a framework or a blueprint. And as I have already alluded to, if you look again in FMT recipients, it's the generation of secondary bile acids that is seen and is associated with successful engraftment, prevention of recurrence, and indeed of firmicute restoration. Why might that be? Well, quite simply, the major producers of the good, guy, the good guy's secondary bile acids are firmicutes. So I just want to leave you with four thoughts. We clearly need an effective treatment of a primary C. diff infection episode. Remembering, though, that it's a toxin-mediated disease associated with microbiome damage. So the second point about optimizing the treatment of C. diff is that we want to minimize the further damage and derangement to the microbiome. And the third point is that by doing that, we want to minimize the risk of C. diff recurrence. And those, those terrible figures of one in four patients left with a recurrence, one in four of the patients treated with vancomycin. And the fourth point is that by minimizing the derangement, by minimizing C. diff recurrence, we can minimize the risk of mortality that is associated, the increased mortality that's associated with C. diff infection. So again, my, my Closing comment is thank you, John, for being a scholar and a gentleman. And the progress we're making to this day to optimizing CD treatment was all started by you. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Wilcox. I think we have uh, time for a few questions. If people want to uh, pose those in the Q&A or the chat section. We can address those. Would you please? share your, your view about natural probiotics um, or any probiotics. Um, I don't know if there's a misspelling there, whether it's meant to be prebiotics, but the, 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 the problem I have with, with probiotic um, options 
is that um, in a numbers game, when you're trying to restore the microbiome, um, giving somebody a single uh, organism, microorganism, um, or perhaps two or three different species, um, that's almost certainly not going to be sufficient to pro provide that framework, that blueprint for micro microbiome restoration. Um, and that, when I say the numbers game, it's just that those, that single bug, even if there's millions of them that you're giving or, or, or hundreds of millions uh, in a yogurt, for example, is very unlikely to establish itself. And even if it is, is that going to be a minimally effective dose? I would suggest it's, it's almost certainly going to be a sub-effective um, dose in terms of minimally effective microbiome restoration. Um, what can we do as patients to prevent C. diff? Um, I, I mean, I suppose the, the, the um, a simple answer would be to adopt Cathy's um, uh, view on life and, and, and say no to antibiotics. Of course, the, you know, there's a time and a place for antibiotics, but you know, if, if patients I just add, add, did a, asked a, you know, were brave enough, and I, I accept it does take bravery to ask a simple question, do, you know, do I need this antibiotic that you're, you're recommending? Um, I think that, that would help clinicians, physicians um, to themselves be brave sometimes. And I don't mean taking undue risks, but you know, there's, there's plenty of situations, typically uh, respiratory tract infections, uh, the great majority of which are caused by viruses where, where an antibiotic is not, not truly indicated unless there are certain particular risk factors. So the simple thing as patients, I think is by questioning that, that whether an antibiotic is really needed. Uh, you know, could I, could I wait two or three days? Could I come back? Could I hold the script? Don't, don't go to the pharmacy for exact, those, those are all other options. Um, the other the remaining question I can see here is, um, could I summarize the pro cons of the use of FMT uh, versus a minimally affected dose? Um, and I was trying to do that in, in my talk, but um, I, I, can, I can see clearly the attractions of, of FMT and, you know, and it really has um, uh, gained an enormous momentum um, uh, in, in the last decade, particularly in the US, but actually worldwide, including Europe. Um, the, the pro is that it's there, there are good data for its efficacy, but it's not quite as good as some would have you believe. And I, and I, and I gave you the data earlier on. Um, the, the, the main con for me is that um, it really is not the minimally effective dose. And but we know that the microbiome plays a role in um, obesity, diabetes, cancer, as well as C. diff infection, just, just to name four things, but there's a much longer list. You could add hypertension to that list, five things. And if you think how common obesity, hypertension and cancer are, for, exa for, for example, um, and diabetes, then should we be as a default position using the whole microbiome and manipulating the whole microbiome um, without truly understanding what we may be doing when we give one person's microbiome to another. We don't have long-term safety data to know whether we're pushing individuals towards becoming obese or hypertensive or diabetic. There aren't any good data at the moment either way. But I think it's much less likely with a minimally effective dose microbiome restoration therapy, less likely that if there is a risk of diabetes by giving someone who's destined to become diabetic, giving their microbiome 
to another person. I think that's less likely if you give them only a component of that microbiome. So not the whole FMT, but for example, just the firmicutes from there. I can't prove that, but it, 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 um, it, that theory is consistent with a minimally effective dose approach to medicine, which pervades everything we do in medicine. We don't give 10 times or 100 times or a million times the dose of a drug required. We give just enough in terms of, in terms of affection, just enough to make sure we're above the levels required to kill the organism. And in this case, not to kill, further derange the microbiome. So I hope that 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 summarizes, I could speak for a lot longer, but summarizes some of the pros and cons of microbiome restoration therapy, the whole FMT versus a minimally effective dose approach. I've had C. diff um, the past three times that I've been prescribed with antibiotics. Does that mean that I will always have C. diff every time I use an antibiotic? Um, uh, and there's a supplementary bit also it is, is, is the diarrheal form of, of um, irritable bowel syndrome uh, common after C. diff. Um, irritable bowel syndrome, the diarrheal version of irritable bowel syndrome occurs in about 10% of patients after having a gastrointestinal infection. The data on what happens after C. diff infection specifically are not good. There's only a few studies, but from the information available, again, perhaps about 10% of patients may develop IBS. The, 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 the more important question for, for you asking it, and I, and I appreciate you must be terrified of the thought of having an antibiotic, rather like Kathy was telling us earlier, um, is will I get C. diff infection? every time I have an antibiotic. I think, unfortunately, there is a, there is a high risk. I, I don't think it is 100% risk. There are some antibiotics that are associated with much lower C. diff risk. A, a, a really good example there would be tetracyclines. And there are some oral tetracyclines that are donkey's years old, very inexpensive antibiotics that are very broad spectrum, but are not associated with C. diff infection. Doesn't mean not associated doesn't mean never, but it does mean much, much lower risk. So if you do need an antibiotic in the future and you're absolutely certain you need it and your physician is certain, then ask, can I have a C. diff low risk antibiotic such as a tetracycline rather than a penicillin or a cephalosporin? or a fluoroquinolone, for example. Dr. Wilcox, looks like you have one more question here, which is, uh, is there any preferred diet to promote the healthiest gut uh, microbiota? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question, thank you. Um, uh, if it's a, a, a healthy diet to promote um, a C. diff resistant microbiome we don't know exactly what it is. However, um, we, uh, I, I mean, I, I would argue that a balanced diet, and I'm, I'm not going to come out and say whether that needs to be um, vegan, vegetarian, carnivore, uh, omnivore, what, whatever, um, but, but a balanced diet from the best we know is associated with a microbiome, and there's lots of different types of microbiome um, across the spectrum of people who live in with different diets, but they all share this colonization resistance against C. diff. And that suggests that there's lots of different types of diet that are good at generating microbiomes that resist C. diff. In the future, you know, we might be able to say, well, you know, a diet that's rich in peas or brus and sprouts and um, it is better at, 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 at protecting against C. diff uh, colonization. But I think that's unlikely, quite frankly, because 
Um, there are so such varied diets, varied microbiomes, which appear to be associated with low C. diff risk. So I, I wouldn't go searching for a diet, a specific diet. I just say have a balanced diet. And we, we think we all know our different versions of what a balanced diet means. The question just appeared in the chat. Do, do I recommend preventative vancomycin dosing in patients um, who've had recurrent C. diff where, when they have antibiotics? Um, the, the, the short answer is um, no, I don't. The, the data um, about using prophylactic vancomycin or, or indeed metronidazole um, are um, there are few data and they're not clear cut as to whether they work in terms of preventing C. diff risk. What I would be particularly worried about is that association of, um, of an exponential increase in C. diff with every antibiotic, every extra antibiotic you receive. So ironically, a prophylactic antibiotic might be pushing you further up that risk escalator rather than doing what you want, which is the opposite. Um, I think in, 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 a, in, a, in a critical situation um, where, you know, let's say uh, it's critical that a patient continues their cytotoxic therapy uh, for, for leukemia, where there's been repeated episodes of C. diff infection, and the worry is that another bout may delay the cytotoxic therapy, which could lead to treatment failure. Uh, there may be an argument in very specific scenarios like that, but what I would far rather do than risk adding to the problem rather than reducing it is go for a low C. diff risk antibiotic along the lines of what I said earlier, aminoglycosides are another example of a low C. diff risk antibiotic. They, they happen to be an old antibiotic class, of course, like, like tetracyclines, um, but there are choices out there, which, which, which is what I think we should be trying, doing that first preferentially, rather than perhaps loading the dice in the wrong way by giving prophylactic antibiotics. question um, is, is again in the context of um, uh, how, would, how would you manage the, an irritable bowel syndrome um, a condition that occurs after C. diff infection and, and are probiotics useful in this instance? Uh, the short answer is we don't know. Um, uh, I, I think uh, if you've got a deranged microbiome, if and, and IBS, then for me, this would be about trying to um, restore that deranged microbiome. And we've talked already today about the ways of doing that. And I, and I don't think that probiotics is likely to be an effective way of doing that. There's probably little, har little harm, um, certainly outside the hospital, setting, and I'll come back to that in a second, uh, of, of, of trying a probiotic, seeing whether that, 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 that can relieve symptoms of IBS in, in, in that particular scenario. The reason I say outside of the hospital setting is that we know inside the hospital setting that the use of some probiotics um, has been associated with unexpected infections because the probiotic that you give me to swallow for my IBS gets into somebody else in the wrong place in somebody else and can cause a, a bacteremia or a fungemia, two different probiotics I'm referring to there. Um, so uh, I, I, I you know, used judiciously uh, in a have a look, have a see, uh, I can see a potential for their use there, but we, we need more data to show whether they're effective. And I don't hold out much hope because of that numbers game I referred to earlier. Uh, Dr. Wilcox, really appreciate you staying a little longer to take our additional questions. Really appreciate your, your time today. So again, uh, I would like to thank uh, each of you who participated in today's conversation.
uh, Dr. Godofsky, Kathy, Barbara, Dr. Wilcox. Again, we learned so much. Uh, this was a very detailed uh, conversation. Through your daily work and the participation today, you are helping to reduce the burdens of C. diff throughout research, prevention, early detection, life-saving therapies, and advocacy. And now we're hearing about uh, prevention as well. So thanks to all of you who tended, tuned in. Thank you again. If you would like to join us for future uh, events like this, please visit the IDSA Foundation website. There's a link in the chat uh, to bookmark and have a great afternoon, everyone.